Hey, moms and dads, it's Dr. Scott back with this next section of food as medicine. So we need to start diving into what is inflammation? Because, you know, until you really understand the process of inflammation that's created by food, then it's probably kind of hard to go and think about how food can have any of these impacts. I remember being there as well. When I first started learning this information, it was it seemed a little bit abstract, but let's start kind of diving into this and break it into a few small pieces so we can start putting context. So here's some key terms. There's, we're gonna use the term inflammation, chronic low-grade inflammation. We'll be talking about pro-inflammatory foods and anti-inflammatory foods. Now, in additional sections here as we go through, we're gonna really specifically lay out foods that are pro-inflammatory and foods that are anti-inflammatory. In this section, we wanna talk about what inflammation is creating. So as we move forward, I wanna give you an analogy, okay? So everyone knows what this is, this is a Big Mac. So when you think about inflammation from food, imagine every single time that you or a loved one ate a bite or even a whole Big Mac, okay? Every single time you would eat that Big Mac, if I came up to you and punched you in the arm, what do you think is gonna happen? Pretty easy, right? You're gonna get a pretty nasty bruise. So, but will it always stay a bruise if every time you do it, let's say you ate a Big Mac or something like a Big Mac every day. Eventually, it's not gonna turn into a bruise anymore. Eventually, that inflammation is gonna cause changes. The tissues are gonna to begin to change because they've been inflamed for so long. Well, when that Big Mac breaks down, this show me delicious Big Mac, when it breaks down, chemically it's really toxic for our body and so what it does is it goes into our body and all of our cells and it creates inflammation and so instead of being a bruise on the outside all of our cells on the inside they're damaged they swell they get bruised and then what starts happening is that that chronic inflammation starts to change the tissues and so when we look at the arteries right when we look at the the tissues when we look at the disease processes, we know that what we see here in this process with the bruise is something that we know is a long-term long -term process of, of the body going down the road of being inflamed for a long time. And so when you look at all of these diseases, right, metabolic syndrome is what they, they call this classification of this low-grade low um, chronic inflammatory um, situation that we're dealing with. And there's a whole host of these diseases. There's PCOS, hypertension, coronary artery disease, increased risk factors for stroke, alcoholic fatty liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, gallstones, psoriasis, you name it. There's a million different things that are involved and are side effects of this process. And so when you look at this, okay, the long-term changes, what we start to develop are things like these fatty deposits. And you know, when we talk about like fatty deposits around, around the heart and the arteries, we don't oftentimes understand necessarily where we come, where they come from. We're told that it's the cholesterol that you eat. That's not entirely true. Cholesterol is deposited in these and they create these fatty deposits, but it's not just because you ate fat. In, in all reality, fat's not really the big problem. Fats are actually an essential for all of us because we need fats in our diet for us to live. If we don't have fats in our diets and in pretty decent quantities, we can't function. This process that you see in front of you this fatty deposit comes from swelling inside of these arteries. And that process of swelling, what it does is it leads to little fissures. And what those fissures do is they expose, kind of like if you scratch the skin on your hand, well, essentially what the same thing is happening is the foods, right? We talk about free radicals, the free radicals and the chemical irritation that comes from the stuff that's in the arteries, as it passes through, they hit the sidewalls and they expose surfaces and what ends up happening is the little, the little LDLs, they start to get in there and they jam in there because they're being caught. And the body recognizes this. So what it'll do is it'll come through and it'll scar it. And so what you see is layer on top of layer on top of layer on top of layer of scarring when the body found these little spots where there was this inflammation and the damage, and then it protects by laying down calcium in, over these fatty deposits. And progressively what happens is the longer that we're inflamed, these, these areas this the section inside of this artery is called a lumen the lumen will start to get more and more narrow over time starting to restrict blood flow and in turn leading to things like high blood pressure leading to this 
coronary artery disease because our arteries are becoming hard and inflexible because there's so much calcium and so much fatty deposits. And what we see is that the normal flow of blood through the arteries becomes more and more difficult. The problem is, is what they're finding is that the medicines are not modifying the risk factors for heart attacks or any of these things. So, so they're having limited benefits overall. So if we can bring down the inflammation, then what our body has the ability to do is actually to change a lot of this stuff inside of the arteries. You know, there's a, a process that I, when I learned about it in school, I was completely blown away by it because I'd never heard it before anywhere in any of the research I had done. And they talk about this concept of what's called angiogenesis. And angiogenesis is really important. If you can stop this process of inflammation in your arteries and you can slow things down so that these things aren't progressing forward, restricting flow, your body actually has nerves inside of these arteries that sense these restrictions and you'll bypass yourself. Your body will literally grow a new artery that circumvents the spot of the blockage and it'll create a new artery to change flow and then it'll get rid of the artery that was plaqued over. Have any of you ever heard that before? Probably most of you have it because I never knew it until I was in, in cardio class. And it's a really important thing to understand that our body's healing potential from these things is greater than what we realize even if we've already got damage. Even if you have some atherosclerosis, it's not the end of the world. It's something that you can change the way that your body is going to adapt and, and deal with risk. Your body, if you can stop the inflammatory process in it, then you may be able to bypass these things on your own. But more importantly, you can stop this process in its tracks just knowing that once you understand food and inflammation, you can alter this. You can prevent this. You can change this if you've already got some of these risk factors. So, and there's nothing that's been ever shown to be more powerful than food in changing the situation. Because all of these diseases that we see here, I mean, everything we talked about in the previous slide, but most of the things that we see our kids and our loved ones and our family struggling with, these are all things that come from this metabolic syndrome, this low grade chronic systemic inflammation that's in every cell and tissue in their body. And all of these things are different expressions because you know none of us have the same genes None of us express the same way, and none of us have the same environment around our genes. So that's why epigenetics is really important. If the environment around the genes, the way that our genes express, is dictated by what we put into our bodies. So if we get rid of all these things that are driving the inflammation, then guess what's going to start to happen? We re reduce the risk for any and all of these conditions tremendously. In many cases, preventing these. Dr. Seaman, who is the researcher who really pioneered a lot of this work, in one of his books about breast cancer talks about how you can essentially knock out the likelihood of breast cancer if you change the, the amount of inflammation in your body it's tremendous and so you know these common diseases that we see things like irritable bowel heart disease type 2 diabetes oa alzheimer's you know what's interesting is is that most people don't realize that they all come from the same inflammatory roots a lot of the research that's being done out there on, on alzheimer's disease right now is actually pointing to the fact that is what they call a central neuropathy. If you have a friend or a loved one that had diabetes and they developed a peripheral neuropathy where they started to lose nerve function in their extremities, especially their feet, well, what they're finding is that Alzheimer's disease is actually the same process happening in their brain, driven by an undetected, potentially type two diabetes, but that attacked the nerves inside of their brain. So what could have potentially happened if you have a loved one that developed Alzheimer's had we been able to know this information and potentially stop this? Or if you have a loved one that has this now, what about if you change the inflammation in their body? Could it potentially improve their function? Yeah. The research is out there that shows that people who eat anti-inflammatory diets with, with Alzheimer's, they see improvements in cognitive function. Pretty cool, huh? So this is the current modern diet. The average American has about 10% of their diet coming from dairy products. And I put neutral on this because there's a lot of confl con conflicting information about dairy. A lot of research says super inflammatory, must avoid. There's a lot that says, oh, dairy's fine, it's essential. I put neutral on here because, you know, whenever you look at conflicting data, if you can't see one side clearly overpowering the other with data and information, call it neutral. So I'm calling it neutral. One to 2% of most people's diets is alcohol. And, you know, if you're talking like having like a glass of wine a day, fine. It actually decreases the likelihood for inflammatory diseases. And we'll talk about that much later. Here's where we start getting into a lot of these big problems. 20% of most Americans' diets is refined grains, pasta, breads, and cereal grains. 
and there's a lot of issues with these things because number one, they're very high on the glycemic index. And we'll dig into that in a later module, but it's the, it's the pace at which your body absorbs the sugars from these foods. And they are very high in an inflammatory fat called omega-6 fatty acids. Many of us have heard of omega-3s, right? They're all over the media, they're in the news, you hear about the, the need for omega-3s to help brain development for kids. They never talk about omega-6s. Omega-6s, they trigger inflammation inside of our body in every single cell that they touch. Our body actually needs a balance of omega-6s to omega-3s at about four to one, four omega-6s to every one omega-3 to be in an inflammatory balance. When we have a high grain diet, we get way out of balance. So the average American, their diet is actually more along the lines of 60 omega-6s to every one omega-3. So this is a huge disparity, which means that most Americans are living chronically inflamed just from the omega-6 imbalance. So then 20% of, of the typical diet is refined sugars. And so refined sugars are, are, are a big one because they're hidden everywhere, right? They are used in all kinds of foods. If you have a processed food, look at the label, you'll probably see sugar added. They're flavor enhancers. They're put into your fast food. Like that's one of the reasons why McDonald's hamburgers taste so good because they put tons of sugar in them, but they're everywhere. Packaged foods, sodas. I mean, oh my gosh, don't get me started on soda, but please don't ever drink soda. And if you do stop, there is literally nothing that we can do to decrease inflammation in your body when you drink soda. It is, is the single biggest thing right now that we cannot modify our risk for when you drink your, your calories, your, when you drink your sugars. Pop has so many things about it that are dangerous, so many things that are damaging. And so many of our kids, so many of our loved ones drink pop. I'd get rid of it right away. It's the single thing that you can do right now that will have a massive impact on your quality of life. 20% comes from refined vegetable oils, you know, and, and refined vegetable oils, you have to understand that we are sold on a lot of these oils being super healthy. That is not the case. So avocado oil, olive oil, coconut oil, those are, those are healthy oils. But when you get into like the corn oils and the vegetable oils, they do a lot of great marketing and it's all a lie. So in, in, if you look at corn oil, okay, corn in terms of its fats, Corn oil produces only omega-6 fatty acids, which we know are inflammatory, no omega-3s at all. Vegetable oils, mostly omega-6 fatty acids. Canola oil, canola oil I wouldn't even touch because canola is, a, is an oil that comes from a thing called the rapeseed. It's a genetically modified oil um, and GMOs by themselves are franken foods. So you really wanna avoid those. But canola oil is made from this thing called the rapeseed and it contains this stuff called eruric acid. Eruric acid is a known neurotoxin. They use the rapeseed to make this stuff called mustard gas that they used in World War I, World War II. It's a significant neurotoxin. And they still haven't been able, to, it's still in canola oil. And there's never been a safe level of it, of it established. So I would encourage you to avoid it because they can't prove that it's safe. And then 15%, 15 to 20% of the average American diet is obese meats, right? If you see fat on your meat, it's an obese meat. And especially because the vast majority of people do not eat meats that are, are organically raised, grass-fed on a normal diet. When you talk about these obese meats, right? So these are, these are industrial farms that they feed them things like grains, they feed them corn products, they feed them sometimes even meat products, which are things that these animals don't eat natively. So they're eating diets that are very foreign to, foreign to their body. They're be, being given antibiotics. They're in close quarters and they're very stressed. So they're secreting high levels of these hormones called, um, called cortisol, which is the, the primary stress hormone that all of us use when we're in fight or flight. But when you talk about these animals, what it does is it creates massive systemic inflammation. And then we eat it and then we get all the inflammation in them into our bodies. So not only are we getting the obese meat fat, and all of this stuff that comes with what they've consumed, but we're also getting all of their stress hormones. And they dysregulate mess of our hormones, our inflammatory processes, weakening our immune function. And unfortunately, only 10% uh, of the diet in the average family is, is made of vegetables and fruits, which are highly anti-inflammatory. You know, sugar consumption, and we talked about that in the last video, but this is a big thing to think about. 200 years ago, Americans only ate about two pounds of sugar per year. By 1970, that, that count was up to about 123 pounds of sugar per year. As of 2017, 154 pounds of sugar per year. That's unbelievable. 
And that is per the Department of Health and Human Services. So this is a really, really crazy stat, ladies and gentlemen, because you know when you look at when you look at the kind of consumption of sugar and inflammatory foods that we all have right now, these are massive contributing factors to why we see so many of our loved ones becoming so sick, but it's such a modifiable factor. So as we go into the next modules here, right, we're gonna start laying out a framework for how we can then start making changes in what we put into our body, how we can start bringing down inflammation, because now once you understand what the problem is, then you can have steps where you can start to change it. I look forward to seeing you in the next module. And if you have questions, make sure that you send me messages here and we can address those directly. See you there, guys.